A long time ago, in a place called Greece, there lived a man called Aristotle. He thought objects tended to stay at rest unless a force acted upon them. How do you explain arrows, then? Some clever people asked. But Aristotle just said that air went around the arrow and pushed it forward. He also claimed freefall and heavenly motion were exceptions to his rule. Oh well. Fast forward almost two millennia to the scientific revolution, when Nicholas Copernicus is proposing the heliocentric model of the universe. Meanwhile, Galileo Galilei is absolutely destroying Aristotle in terms of science. He discovers a bunch of stuff like the constant acceleration of gravity and the law of classical relativity, but we're interested in something else, a thought experiment. Galileo said, if I let a ball roll into a bowl, it will always climb back to the top on the other side. If I make the bowl longer, this still happens, so if I make the bowl infinitely long, the ball will just keep rolling. Boom, Aristotle. Impetus has been defeated. Objects tend to stay at a constant velocity unless a force acts upon them, a fact Newton eventually restated in his first law of motion. Speaking of whom, Newton, the legend. He basically established classical mechanics. He discovered and stated his three laws of motion, which govern essentially all phenomena, and discovered the universal law of gravitation, which helped discover planets, predict orbits, and land humans on the moon. Except Einstein later found out that it wasn't completely right. In order to do the calculations for these notions, Newton also had to invent basic calculus. Got him, Leibniz. Think about that. He invented calculus. So, yeah, pretty great. Then along came Lagrange. He found that we don't need all those arbitrary equations from Newton. There is one equation for every experiment that tells us everything we could ever want. Unsurprisingly, he called this equation the Lagrangian. His theory, based on something called the Action Principle, is used absolutely everywhere in physics today. Next up is Hamilton. No, not the Alexander one, the William Rowan one, who essentially took Lagrange's work to the next level. He made a different theory, where momentum and position are linked together in an equation unsurprisingly called the Hamiltonian, as opposed to the Lagrangian, which uses position and velocity. This also tells us everything we could ever want to know about the system. The Hamiltonian is also equal to the total energy of whatever system it describes. So, you know, that's pretty cool too. As you can see, the equations for the Hamiltonian also have a certain duality, a symmetry about them. And don't worry, we'll come back to this later when we talk about Noether. Then, Poisson. This guy found a totally new way, again, of looking at the problem. So much of physics could be described by these weird brackets, unsurprisingly, again, called Poisson brackets. This elegant notation even found its way into quantum mechanics in the form of the infamous commutator. Finally, Noether. As Einstein puts it, she was the most significant creative mathematical genius thus far produced since the higher education of women began. In any case, she worked off of Poisson's brackets and the link between momentum and position with Hamilton to discover the most beautiful theorem ever. She found that if you shift an experiment in some way and the result doesn't change, there's a specific quantity that was conserved. If you shift an experiment in space, and it's the same, momentum was conserved. In time, energy was conserved. And finally, if you shift the gauge, or as you many will later see, something called the phase of an experiment, charge was conserved. But those topics deserve a video of their own. So there you go, the basic history of classical mechanics in a nutshell. By the time Emmy Noether completes her theory, Einstein is essentially finished with general relativity. Beyond that, quantum mechanics takes the lead, but another brief history will do for that.